Good to see all of you. We want to continue in our series that uh, we've been in now for a few weeks on uh, the helper. I think we have kind of established that in life we all need help from time to time. You know, there's, uh, there's so much to do and so little time to do it, right? It's always great to have somebody help us. But in our series, we're talking about something even greater, a greater help, uh, if you will. We're on a journey, and we're learning about um, the Holy Spirit and experiencing the fullness of the Spirit uh, in our lives, the Helper. And over the last uh, few weeks, uh, by the way, if you've missed any of the messages, you can always go online and check them out, okay? So just so you know. But over the last few weeks we've discovered who the Holy Spirit is, that He's not, you know, like some distant force or some mystical power that God uses. He's rather a person, okay? He's the person. Just as God the Father is a person and Jesus Christ is, uh, God's Son is a person, the Holy Spirit uh, is a person. And here, of course, we see the Trinity, one God, three in one, in three persons. Um, and, and, and we've explored the fullness of the Spirit as well, or the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and what the Bible's talking about when it talks about those things. Uh, a life that's saturated or immersed in the Spirit, a life that's yielded to the Holy Spirit each and every day. We, we, we taught how productive the Spirit-filled life can be um, uh, it grows, doesn't it? It grows when we're yielded. It grows and it, it exhibits the characteristics of God when properly submitted. Characteristics such as love and, and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and, and self-control. Scripture, of course, talks about these characteristics uh, being, or he names them to be the fruit of, of the Spirit. And in other words, it's the Spirit that produces these characteristics in our lives, again, when we're surrendered, when we're yielded to the Spirit. And then last week, we began considering the gifts of the Spirit, these power gifts that God wants to give us, how God takes our natural, say, inclinations or even abilities, and then He amplifies them supernaturally, uh, giving us empowering gifts to carry out his mission. If you want to explore uh, that more, I would, I would encourage you to, uh, to um, first of all, take, take the Living in the Spirit life group at some point, and you can delve into this on a, a much deeper level, all of it. Or, or um, take this Discover Your Spiritual Gifts um, uh, survey, and it, it, it's just a tool, okay? It's, it, this didn't float down from heaven or anything like that. But it's, it's a tool that might show you where God would like to gift you or, or is gifting you, so take advantage uh, of that. Today we're going to go a little bit deeper um, into exploring the gifts of the Spirit. We can't talk about every single one of them, um, but we want to look at and discover a, a little more about the why and the how uh, they are to function within a church or within a gathering. So much of what we do is just kind of what we've seen, all right? Uh, we know that these gifts of the Spirit help us, of course, on the assignment. That's what they're for. They aren't given so that we can get all excited about them and even worship them in some settings. No, they're for an assignment, which is the mission of Jesus. This mission is a rescue project to seek and save the lost, right? So these gifts, they reveal a, a perfect and loving God to an imperfect people broken by sin. How many know God gifts us to show that, to seek and save lost, um, spiritually lost people, to make disciples? It's the gifts of the Spirit that empower us to take people on that journey, not only ourselves but others, uh, to meet human need. Human need can be so overwhelming, can't it? But through the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, we can meet those needs. Now, in order for that to happen in the fullest way, the fullest way possible, not that it can't happen, but in the fullest way possible, God has given us, again, the helper, the Holy Spirit, and the gifts of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit to empower us, to gift us for the mission that we've been talking about. And that's 
That is the enduring evidence of Holy Spirit baptism, um, being a witness for Jesus. That has been a disconnect sometimes in the Pentecostal church. We forget what the true purpose of all of it is for that, that, that we be a witness for Jesus, right? They were to wait to receive power so that they could be witnesses. They could tell their God story. All right, let's look at Paul's words to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, we're going to look at, start with verse 7. I want you to check out verse 7. It says, to each is given, in the ESV, it says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The New Living Translation puts the same verse this way. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. God wants to empower us so that we can help each other, right? So we can help each other to make a spiritual difference, a supernatural difference in our world. We need help for that. When each one of us welcomes the helper, welcomes the Holy Spirit to fill and, and work through us, people around us will be touched powerfully with God's love. Amen? Amen. The hungry, in other words, will be fed as God empowers us. The, the lonely will find belonging. The, the hurting will experience healing. The, the broken will be made whole. The spiritually lost will become spiritually found. <coughs> how amazing is it? Think about it, you guys. How amazing is it that people will literally encounter Jesus through you? Through you. Through you, through me as well. Amen? That's an incredible thing. Now, these gifts of the Spirit are not, are, are, are not only effective uh, for reaching the world, they reach into the life of the church. They reach into the life of the church to help us become a much more effective force for God. Christ followers, Christians, um, are the church. Do you know you are the church, Right? They're the church. People who have placed their trust in Jesus Christ are the church. It's a, it's a family of faith. It's a place of belonging and encouragement. At least I hope it is for you where we learn to love, grow, and serve God uh, together. And so when we gather, we invite God to use us here as well. Amen? To help one another, to spur one another on. And, and, we, and so when we walk through the doors here... You're seeing the Holy Spirit at work. Don't, don't be um, tunnel vision when it comes to the Holy Spirit. When we walk through the doors of this church, you're seeing the Holy Spirit at work so, so that we can help one another, so we can spread our People are serving others. Do you know there's a gift called, of the Holy Spirit called service. People are serving, uh, people are encouraging, people are uh, comforting one another. We pray for each other. We, we pray for miracles in people's lives, don't we? We pray for healings in people's lives. We pray that God will be working supernaturally. Those are all gifts of the Holy Spirit. When you're enjoying a cup of coffee, when you, and how many enjoy your coffee? Yeah, there we go. Now the hands go up. Northwest people, <laughs> there you go. When we enjoy a cup of coffee, you're enjoying somebody's gift of hospitality. There's a gift called the gift of hospitality. Uh, when Holy Spirit-filled people welcome you, right, you're experiencing the gifts of the Spirit in operation. It's not just when somebody speaks out like they did here this morning, which is wonderful. It's much more than that. We don't always think about that, do we? When children in kids' life are being ministered to, oftentimes when the person is yielded to the Holy Spirit, they're benefiting from a spirit gift called teaching. They're benefiting from a spirit gift called prophecy. Prophecy is the proclamation of God's Word. They're benefiting from service. That is the Holy Spirit at work. Are you seeing it? At work through these people when they're yielded to the helper, as the helper's using them. 
You know, well, thank you so much, Skip. Am I painful to listen to? I'm coming off a cold, so. Um, I, just, I want you to celebrate something with me. Fifteen people were baptized in water last month. I think it's awesome. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's working on people's hearts, right? But beyond that, the Holy Spirit's working in people's lives who are helping people journey in their spiritual steps. Come on. Absolutely. Such great things, eternal things, God things. The helper gifts us for the common good. Can you say that with me? The helper gifts us for the common good. For the good of humanity and for the good of the church. So let's explore how some of these specific gifts are to be used most effectively. Paul writing again to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We start again with verse 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and someone else, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and to another, ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages or tongues, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. And I will just interject here. Um, within the context that is needed, right? He distributes those. Last verse, the human body, he illustrates it now, has many parts, but the many parts make up the one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. You, you guys, I love this because we see these very ex various expressions of God's power in action, don't we? In action. Remember that the gifts here are the same gifts that flowed through Jesus in his earthly ministry. The, 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 difference, the only difference being he now expresses them through his body. He expresses them through his church. He expresses them through you and, 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 and through me when we are yielded and full of the Spirit. Each person is given something to do. Nobody's exempt. Each person is given something to do, gifts that show who God is. Each of you can show who God is through the gift that God gives you. Every gift, uh, everyone gets in on it, in, in other words. Everyone benefits as a result. Do you, are you getting the picture that Paul is describing for us? All the parts of the body, all the systems are working together and are critical. If just one person... Or one part isn't functioning properly, it impacts the health of the whole body. Let's continue. Verse 27, all of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. Now, he's just saying here are some. First are apostles, second are prophets, third are teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing. He's not talking about better. Just saying, here are some of them. Those who can help others. Those who have the gift of leadership. Those who speak in unknown languages or tongues. Uh, are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Well, God might gift you in different circumstances with all. Who knows? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages, tongues? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? I'm talking here about in a corporate setting. Of course not. So, sh so should, or yeah, so sh you should earnestly desire um, the most helpful gifts. Again, I would say within the situation in which you find yourself. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. That's an interesting phrase there at the very end. Why this statement? Because 
properly used gifts are effective. Properly used gifts are effective. Gifts used properly are wonderful and powerful and effective. Flip side, gifts misunderstood and misused, not so much. Not so much. They are ineffective and can be confusing. Gifts misused won't glorify Jesus. And that's the purpose of the gifts. They won't build up believers. They won't correct, they won't connect with those who, they won't connect those who don't know the Lord. They, they won't meet the needs of the world to the level that only the power of God can do. And so Paul offers to teach us the better way to use the gifts that God gives us. Let's keep reading. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read now from the ESV Again, 1 Corinthians, starting with chapter 13. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and get over, give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Notice what the Apostle Paul is getting at. Without love, the gifts are meaningless. Paul then describes what love looks like. What should fuel our actions, our moving in the gifts of God. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And love never fails. God wants us to grasp that all gifts are to function with love. All gifts are to function with love. Because God is love. And the gifts are a gift of love. To us, to help us. Without the love of Christ flowing in and through you and me, the gifts are ineffective. They're incomplete. It doesn't matter if they're happening or not. Sure, we can help a person in need, but when we're living out Christ's love, it not only ministers to the body, it ministers to the soul and to the spirit. By the way, that's why I love Convoy of Hope who we're going to have an opportunity to help on Easter Sunday. You know, they're a strategic partner of ours that helps with disaster relief and feeding children all over the world and just, in general, helping people that are less fortunate up, you know, in, in the world. But the thing I love about them, they do a great job feeding tons of people and ministering Jesus to people, but here's the thing I love about them. They don't care who gets the credit. I've worked with them. I've been out on the field with them. They partner with all kinds of people. And if that other organization gets the credit, who cares? Because their goal is that people are ministered to with the love of God. And it doesn't matter how it happens, whether they get it in the news or somebody else gets it in the news. They are motivated by love. Friends, that's the way it should be with the gifts of the Spirit. All the gifts of the Spirit. It's powerful and life-changing because it's more than temporary, isn't it? It's spiritual. It's eternal. So every gift needs to, be, needs to be practiced, lived out, expressed through love, through love. We also re- need to understand that all gifts of the Spirit are valuable. 
And this is where, in our tradition, I think many times we've gone awry. We have elevated certain gifts so high that we've minimized a great number of the other gifts. And it's like, if these are happening, then the Spirit's moving. Who cares if everything else is happening? Right? Stay with me. All expressions of God's gifts are grace. They're just God's unmerited favor on us, right? They're all expressions of God's power working through us. All of them are necessary for the mission. I, I can't tell you how many people come to know Jesus because somebody helped them and also because they heard a proclamation of the word of God. They all are used in mighty ways. All the gifts of the Spirit can be used to express God's love and power effectively. For instance, the gift of teaching and the gift of serving are actually equally valuable. Understand that when the Spirit is moving in the church through, say, hospitality or through prophecy, it's equally valuable. Some of you are not so sure. I don't know if I was raised that way. That's what the Bible says. The occasion determines what's most needed. All right? What's most valuable is what's most needed in the moment. Those with the gift of healing, when somebody needs to be healed, that's what's most valuable in the moment. When somebody needs to be helped, that's what's most valuable in the moment. When somebody needs to hear the word of God declared in a specific saying, that's what's most valuable in the moment. Sometimes my hands are what's most valuable. When I sit down to, to study and to, to type on my computer and write things up and those sorts of things, my hands become the most valuable in the moment. When I need to walk or run, not so much. My feet become, my legs become the most valuable. Does that make sense to you guys? Absolutely. This is vital to grasp. I can't overemphasize that. Because if we don't grasp it, we'll undervalue certain gifts and we'll overvalue others. And you say, well, is that really important? Yes, because when we do that, we get off mission. And so Paul addresses this quite clearly in, in, in the ch 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. And he talks about how Jesus expressed his love and through these wonderful gifts and the fact that we can do that as well as we move in the gifts. But we have to practice them properly and in order. You know that God is a God of order. I, I don't know where we get this idea that if God's really moving, it's chaos. Because from Genesis to Revelation, it's very orderly. And so for gifts to be truly effective, they have to be used in order. Remember, the purpose of spirit empowerment is to what? Glorify Jesus. Or the, one of the primary purposes is to glorify Jesus. But if misused, they can distract people from Jesus. Am I meddling with you? They can draw attention to people rather than Jesus. Spiritual gifts are to edify and build people up in Christ. In Christ. But if misused, they can confuse and frustrate and discourage people. They are to connect people with Jesus. But if misused, they can actually drive people away from Jesus. I've seen it. They are to meet the needs of humanity. Amen? Amen? But if misused, they're ineffective, and they become only to the body. People are drinking water, but they don't have spiritual water. Come on. My point is when we are guided by the Holy Spirit, we will want to practice our God-given gifts properly and effectively. 
or decently and in order. We learn in 1 Corinthians 14.40, Paul writing again to the Corinthians because they had all kinds of problems about the gifts and how they functioned. They were functioning oftentimes out of order. And so he says, but all things should be done decently, properly, and in order. And I would suggest, like Paul, that we really consider, all of us, how are we using the gifts? It's fairly evident how um, to lovingly practice um, and function in some of the gifts. It becomes, you know, pre pretty evident how you do it. However, there are a few gifts, uh, specifically the vocal gifts, that can sometimes be improperly used, causing confusion rather than edification. And you guys, I know because I'm the pastor. So I get all the questions, pros, cons, everything in between. Okay? Paul presents us with the assumption that the vocal gifts, such as prophecy, exhortation, speaking in unknown languages, tongues, when it's done to a, in a corporate setting, the interpretation will be part of church gatherings. He, he's assuming that that's going to be happening Sunday mornings, just like here today. But the Apostle Paul says he would rather they not function if they aren't done decently and in order. And so today, sadly, there's a lot of churches, though they embrace the Holy Spirit, they do not allow the vocal gifts to function in their gatherings, especially Sunday mornings. And that's because, in some cases, many cases, because the vocal gifts have been misused. Sadly, they are throwing, I would say, the baby out with the bathwater. Some churches affirm the teaching of the fullness of the Spirit, but they don't practice the fullness of the Spirit. Privately, it's okay. You know, it's okay to do that privately. Maybe in a small group setting, it's okay. But not on Sunday morning. And they make that decision. I don't personally agree with that, just so you know, um, with this approach. But I can understand why some churches get there. It's because the misuse of the gift has been so damaging. I believe the Bible teaches us that vocal gifts are designed by the Spirit to work in every service, every context, appropriately and in order. That the Holy Spirit will never sponsor a vocal gift that is disruptive or will drive people away from Christ. By the way, that's why we try to explain when somebody speaks out. I even have come people come up to me and say, why do you explain that? I wish you wouldn't explain that. It's not just for you. I know you might get it. You've been in it for 40 years. But there's people that don't have any understanding. They need to understand what's happening so it can benefit them. Oh, a little more emotion came out there than I anticipated. <laughs> Went way beyond my Scandinavian heritage. I would suggest that the biblical example is both and, okay? What if we welcome all the gifts of the Spirit, however we expect them all to function decently, properly, and in order? Um, by the way, prophecy, I think oftentimes when we hear prophecy, we think, of, we think of foretelling, like predicting the future. That's part of prophecy. But most prophecy that we hear is a foretelling, foretelling, excuse me, foretelling, or a declaration of what God is saying. To the church. Do you know, I mean, I'm not just biased, that sermons can be prophecy? That God is actually speaking? I, please say yes. Somebody say amen. <laughs> when our worship team comes, they have been prayerfully seeking the Spirit 
Asking God to use them. Asking God the songs to speak to people's hearts. What they say in between songs would speak to people's hearts. It can be very prophetic. But unless it's in a certain context and it happens a certain way, it didn't happen. Really? All the vocal gifts are much more effective if exercised with very with intentionality, spontaneity, certainly, but with intentionality. In fact, I'm going to take it a step further. I have no problem with Fran has exercised gifts for years and others here in the church. I have no problem with that. But I'm telling you, how important. it's not like it couldn't happen where somebody steps into the foyer on Sunday and they have the gift that God has blessed them with, maybe prophecy or exhortation, encouragement to people. And they say, you know, God gave me, they sit in the door and they say, God gave me a gift, pastor or, or campus pastor. You know, I just want you to know that. Is there a place where you think it would be fitting today? I would love to share that. You guys, when we do stuff like that, in order and stuff like that, it becomes even more powerful. All of a sudden now, you have the leader. By the way, the leader has the gift of administration. administration. You know what that does? It administrates the service. So now you've gone to the administrator who says, boy, that would fit just perfectly here in this service. And that person then said, you know, now would be the perfect time. They don't have to shout. They don't have to scare anybody next to them. Any of those types of things. Now they can step up with the microphone and they have the authority of church leadership behind them. I'll bet you it's much more received. Because of all those dynamics. That are happening. Paul says there's a better way. All the gifts of the Spirit, they function through Spirit guided planning, spontaneity, in the moment, all those wonderful things. Friends, God is loving and He wants to speak to us. That's why He gave us the Word of God. Amen? We study the Word together, we worship together. Uh, we also, it's expressed through people functioning in vocal gifts. But again, vocal gifts, uh, they're just most important in that moment. All the gifts are just as important. God's chosen to express his love through his people. I want to get to one other thing before we close it up. Okay, we're almost done here. But I want to talk about the gifts, gift of tongues here for just a moment. Or some version would say the gift of speaking an unknown language. Um, uh, we read primarily about this, of course, in the book of Acts. And, and believers are waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be empowered, just as Jesus has instructed them. He's the baptizer, by the way, of the Holy Spirit. And so we have scriptures like this, Acts 2.4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We believe those are, that's still functioning. It's still for today. This gift of the Spirit, though, functions in three different ways, which can cause a lot of confusion in the church. First, it functions, uh, we believe, as the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Of the five instances in the book of Acts, when you go through and people uh, we know legitimately or explicitly received uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, three um, explicitly mentioned that people spoke in unknown tongues there. The other two strong arguments could be made that it's happened to them as well. So the gift of tongues serves as the initial physical evidence of the spirit that the Spirit has saturated or immersed a person's life. The second would be for personal edification and, and, and prayer. But they may never be called on to speak to a church in a corporate setting. It's personal. The gift of tongues is a personal Prayer language, uh, prayer addresses God, you know. It includes the praise and thanks and petition and confession and, and, and even more, right? But, and, and, we, and, and I don't know about you, but I don't always have the, the English words to express, especially in, in deep situations or just how is this going to happen. And so uh, I thank the Lord for this wonderful gift in my life. I can begin to allow the Spirit to pray through me in a language I don't understand. And it, it's so edifying. It's so comforting. It's powerful, <coughs> excuse me, in my life. And every believer has that opportunity to seek the Holy Spirit and to expect this wonderful gift to be given to you. Can I, let me just say something here too, that 
God is going to give you these, uh, this unknown language within your, your heart, not so much your head, but in your heart. And, but you have to be in faith, speak that out. Just like you receive salvation by faith, right? Uh, when you receive that gift, you have to speak it out by faith. God is planting this here. I'm going to begin speaking it out. When it happened to me, it was just a couple of words that God hid in my heart. And I just kept saying them pretty soon. It's like the dam broke. Um, and, and pretty soon it's just flowing in, in my life. Now, the third function would be for corporate edification. So that's different, right? The gift used to address a group. Paul, uh, admonition, just so we all know, is that the gift of prophecy is the most effective in corporate settings. Any, any idea as to why? Because in English, everybody understands it. You don't need interpretation in order for it to happen. However, when it's exercised properly, um, like all the gifts, it's powerful. It's effective. All right. Um, George Wood, former general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, of which we are a part, tells a story that when he was in college, he went to a chapel service. And during the service, um, someone spoke out in a message, uh, spoke a message in an unknown language, tongues, right? And, and a young woman shared the interpretation of what was spoken out. Later that, that evening, George was, was um, uh, talking to another student, Arthur, and he was talking to Arthur because he was very emotional. Arthur was super emotional. And, and so George r related what Arthur said um, to him. Why that emotion? And he says, I've been very discouraged, Arthur says. I've been very discouraged. Uh, I'm away from my home and my family, and I'm, I'm in a foreign land, and I just wondered if God knew where I was. Okay? And George is like listening to Arthur, and he says, the message in tongues tonight was in Mandarin. Um, my native language. And the interpretation in English was virtually perfect. It was such an encouragement and comfort to me. I love this phrase. This is his exact phrase. That God knew where I was. You see how that gift was helpful? How that, that built that, that believer, in this case, up. Can I tell you another story? Um, we're on your time now, okay? So... Um, <laughs> When I was in Honduras many years ago on a mission trip, um, we were in a church service down there, many of them, but on this particular church service, it was full of people. It was just packed with people, and it was all in Spanish. There wasn't a word of English being spoken anywhere except from our team, <laughs> right? And so we, we entered now, and it's in praise and worship, and I could figure out at least that it's praise and worship. How do you know the Spirit bears witness with your spirit, right? And so we're worshiping God, and, and I, I'm just saying to myself, I'm saying, you know what? I'm just going to start praising the Lord in my prayer language, you know, in tongues. I'm just going to start praying. Who's going to know the difference? <laughs> you know, type of thing. And so I just started praising the Lord, and I was caught up in worship. It really was a wonderful, impactful evening in my life to this day. And afterwards, all of a sudden, this crowd of people comes around me. I'm like, what's, what? <laughs> what's happening? You know, all these people are crowded around me. And then I, I, were, I bring an interpreter over to me because I can't understand what they're saying. They're just shooting Spanish at me so fast I can't even, it's, I, you know, I know where's the bathroom, right? And so they're all, they're all coming around me, and, and they're excited. They are so excited. They're saying, and, and I'm asking, what are they excited about? They want to know where you learn to praise the Lord so beautifully in fluent Spanish. And my first thought was, it didn't sound like Spanish to me. <laughs> but they were hearing it in Spanish. And here it becomes a sign because that group, I was told many of them were unbelievers. And so it became a powerful sign to them of God's presence and power and love. Does that make sense? All this to say, God, the Holy Spirit, uses a variety of people in a variety of ways. The gifts of the Spirit are effective when used properly, in order, and most importantly, in love. In love. 
If you've never sought the infilling power of the Holy Spirit, I would encourage you to do that. If you would like me to lay hands on you and pray for you, I would be overjoyed to do that. Um, if you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit is doing a work in your life, obviously, transforming you, but empowering you. If you've never um, experienced that or if you have, we need to be continually filled because we're on a mission. I need to be fueled up every day. <laughs> Amen? And so I would encourage you to pursue that. It doesn't have to happen in a church service. For me, it happened next to my bed in my bedroom. My mom said, would you like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I was like, I don't know. It's pretty weird. <laughs> because I didn't know. But I wanted all of God. I wanted everything, absolutely everything God had for me. And so I said, yes. She said, I'm just going to lay hands on you and pray. She just prayed a simple prayer. In the name of Jesus, Lord, fill David with your Holy Spirit. That was it. I was like, wow. I guess I wasn't the one to get it. And I just went into my room and I just began seeking God. And every time I started seeking God, just these words I've never learned before started coming to me. And so I just stepped out. The first time I stepped out and said them, I thought, that's stupid. I made those up. But I just kept doing it. I figured, hey, how can I go wrong operating in faith, just believing God wants, like, believing that God uh, is doing this for me? How can you go wrong with that? God's going to honor that, right? That was my thought. And sure enough, pretty soon, the floodgate just opened. It has been an incredible part of my life. It's an incredible part of my sermon preparation. It's an incredible part of every time I enter into counseling, I usually spend a lot of time speaking in my prayer language because I want the Spirit of God to be praying through me for things I don't even know to pray about Amen. so I can be effective and powerful in whatever situation I might find myself in. And I'm very mindful. It's just, a gra it's just God's grace. I'm not special because of it. It's just God's grace, and he wants to use me, and he wants to use you. So open up your heart to all of God. It's all through the New Testament. I'm way over my time. I'm way into your time now. The mother of Jesus in the upper room received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All the disciples in the upper room received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All those early believers in that upper room when they were praying received the Holy Spirit. All of them spoke in tongues as initial physical evidence that the Spirit of God had fallen. But, but the, the Holy, baptism of the Holy Spirit is not about speaking in tongues. That was prophetic. It's about power to be a witness. And that's what it's been in my life, certainly. Worship team, will you come? Amen. Thanks for giving me some liberty this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for oh, your, your will to love people, to see people saved, for sending Jesus to apply that will, to accomplish that will. To sending the Holy Spirit to empowering Jesus to not necessarily draw on his divinity but to move in your mighty power just as a, as a man full of the Spirit of God. And Lord, that you extend that same power unto us so that we can be extensions of you, ambassadors of you, as though God was pleading through us, empowering us to be on your wonderful mission of this wonderful kingdom that has no end. Touch people, Lord. Baptize people, Lord. Saturate people. Immerse people in your spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.